So uh, my name is Danielle McLean. Um, lots of familiar faces here, and it's good to see you all, and lots of new faces as well. We were just talking about three years ago, I don't think hydrogen was mentioned once at these conventions, and now I think only one presentation didn't mention hydrogen. So that's super exciting. And a little bit about me. So the way this panel will work is I'll give you a quick overview of me, panelists, and then we'll just jump into a Q&A. And you all can jump in and ask questions at any time. Just raise your hands and somebody will bring you a mic, though we can't really see you. So raise it big and make movement so we can see you. Um, so yeah, it'll be informal, fun conversation and lots of engagement. So please don't be shy. Uh, so a little bit about High Sky Society. Um, we started about, so my first company, we were a for-profit hydrogen eVTOL company. And we were looking at, you know, what are things that we can do that can really extend the range of these vehicles? My co-founder of that company, Dr. Rachel Locks, is an MD. And so her passion is obviously saving lives. Mine is saving the planet. And putting those minds together, thinking, okay, how can we save the most lives with aviation without destroying the planet? And it turns out that a lot of those flights that save lives are around 300 miles. If you think about going to rural areas, you think about organ deliveries, organ you know, transplants. Um, sometimes you have to get search and rescue, emergency search and rescue. Those flights tend to be way longer than 100 miles. And so while we love the idea of flying over traffic, that wasn't really where we were passionate. What we were passionate about is saving the lives of the most people with aviation without trashing the planet. And so we started looking at companies that were doing exactly that. And of course, it didn't take us long to learn about Dr. Martine Rothblatt and United Therapeutics and some of the amazing things that they're, they're doing with Ehong, who's already flown hundreds, at least dozens, maybe hundreds of passenger flights um, with organ manufacturing and mass delivering. And so that, we fell in love with that idea and you know, seeing what Mikkel and some of the team at United Therapeutics and Beta um, are all doing is just really exciting. So we start thinking, is there a way that hydrogen can do these longer flights? And what we learned is, yes, there is. We looked at all different kinds of fuels. And so why hydrogen? Why now? Well, it turns out, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the elephant in the room, okay? And you guys are gonna participate in this. Hydrogen did not cause the Hindenburg to blow up. Everyone together. Hydrogen did not cause the Hindenburg to blow up. All right, if you take one thing away from this, that's the takeaway. But it turns out hydrogen is really safe to use. And as a lot of us know who's taken Dr. Wong's class, it's got really high specific energy. The, volume, the volumetric density isn't exactly where we want it, but we, that's a conversation for another day, but we're working on that. Um, but you know, hydrogen's been used safely in other industries for years. If you look at the forklift industry, there's already infrastructure, they use it. And I, I wouldn't say that hydrogen is safer than any other gas that we use day to day, but it's certainly as safe. Um, different properties make it safer. And so there are a lot of reasons why it can be used today. And like I said, it's been effectively used in other industries. The challenge is not a lot of them are in aviation. And so that's exactly why High Sky Society exists. We started in 2020 with Vertical Flight Society um, with, as the H2 eVTOL Council. And there were a handful of us that participated in Agility Prime in 2020 that were looking at hydrogen out of the hundreds of companies. And um, we all had different ideas and visions on you know, how to bring hydrogen to fruition. Some people thought gas, some people thought liquids, I've heard of solid state, I've seen all different types of aircraft configurations. And so we all kind of bonded together and started this little group called the H2E VTOL Council, where we meet on the third Mondays of every month. A year later, we had over 100 participants. Two years later, we had over 300 participants. And six months ago, we had over 400, and I think we're over 1,000 now. Um, and we got so much traction. There was so much technology. These webinars are invaluable. You just won't believe how far this technology is compared to like what we traditionally think about in aviation. 
And so we decided, you know, th this is a really successful group. It needs to spin off into its own project. So Mike and I got together and we said, okay, High Sky Society needs to, you know, have its wings and take off and do its own thing. And so that's what High Sky Society is. We, we were very grateful to Mike Kirschberg and Vertical Flight Society for providing us that platform to really launch this technology. And if we look at, you know, Europe and other places, they're a lot further along than the U.S. And there wasn't an organization here that was specifically focused on advancing hydrogen and aviation. So we have our big event in June. It is called Flying High. We'll have over a thousand participants, over a hundred presentations, and we bring together all the pieces of the ecosystem that I like to call, and I'm sorry, Dre, I'm gonna say buckets because I'm an engineer and we like the word buckets for some reason. If somebody knows a better word, please tell me because I've been saying buckets, but there's six buckets essentially that need to come together to make this happen. And of course, the big one in the middle is the aircraft. And as you learn in Dr. Wong's class, you look at your mission profile, that's gonna tell you, you know, how big, how heavy, how far, how fast, how often, and then that's gonna size your fuel cell, that's gonna tell you how much hydrogen you need, which is gonna, you know, inform the refueling station how much hydrogen they need, how much hydrogen needs to be transported, produced, et cetera. So it all needs to really be focused around that mission profile. And that's what High Sky Society is, is we bring that ecosystem together to focus on the aircraft and bring hydrogen aviation to fruition. So mark the date, June 21st through June 23rd is flying high. Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our amazing panelists today. And this will just be an informal conversation. Like I said, you all can ask questions. Um, I'll start out with some questions, but if you have any, um, just raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. So cool. All right, Elizabeth Collins is a researcher and engineer by training on the hydrogen production power and storage team at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Elizabeth primarily works, excuse me, Elizabeth's work primarily focuses on teleeconomic analysis, data analysis, and modeling of hydrogen and end use systems. Specifically, her projects look at medium and heavy duty fuel cell vehicles and fueling stations, airport infrastructure, combined heat and power systems, among others. In addition to analysis and modeling work, she performs hardware testing on light duty hydrogen vehicle refueling nozzles. Elizabeth, excuse me, refueling nozzles. Elizabeth Elizabeth received an engineering degree from Columbia University in 2021. So please give a warm welcome to Elizabeth. Welcome. John Piasecki received a bachelor's degree in political science with distinction from Yale University. In 1989, he joined Piasecki Aircraft as executive assistant to the president and was responsible for proposal development, contract negotiation, and administration. In 1991, Mr. Piasecki's responsibilities were expanded to include oversight of all business development and financial aspects of the company, as well as purchasing human resources, strategic planning, public and government relations. In 2008, he assumed the role of president and CEO with responsibility for leading the overall management of the company. Mr. Piasecki serves on the board of the Vertical Lift Consortium, is a member of the American Helicopter Museum Executive Advisory Board, is a trustee of Foreign Policy Research Institute, and former public policy chair of the Philadelphia Philadelphia chapter of the American Institute of AIAA. <laughs> Mr. Piasecki is an FAA licensed fixed wing pilot and a member of the Vertical Flight Society, National Defense Industry Association, Yale Alumni Schools Committee, the Hedford School Advisory Board, and a former director of the Opera Company of Philadelphia. Please welcome Mr. John Piasecki. Dr. Alex Ivanenko is general manager rotorcraft and new segments at Zero Avia. He's the ex-co-founder and CEO of High Point, who I might also add that I believe John and Alex have both been part of H2E VTOL since day one, the council that we started, if I remember correctly. Um, Alex and then Elizabeth joined us, I think, about a year ago. Uh, Alex held senior roles at both 3M Corp and Owners Corning. In 2019, he founded High Point, the NASA award-winning Silicon Valley startup pioneering air-cooled hydrogen HTPEM fuel cell. And I'll let Alex tell us what that acronym stands for. I do know, but I'm not going to say it. Fuel cell systems for aviation and urban air mobility. He attended Saratov State Technical University, where he received his bachelor's and master's degrees, both in engineering, as well as a PhD in electrochemistry. Please, please welcome Dr. Alex Ivanenko. <laughs> so.
So thank you so much, everybody, for being here and our amazing panelists. And I will start off with a three-part question, and I encourage anybody from the audience to chime in as well. So I mentioned earlier that Europe was a lot further along with hydrogen aviation than we are here in the U.S. How do you view the landscape for hydrogen and aviation in North America right now? Is the U.S. going in the right direction with the incentives of the Inflation Reduction Act? And I'll also say, like, with Build Back Better and um, the other one, the Jobs Act. What needs to be done? Can you, can you hear me? Okay. So once again, uh, thank you very much that you're having me today at the panel. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, transfer on your questions. So uh, when we incorporated our company in the United States, so we face the situation that uh, uh, there is no enough support from government to, uh, for, for hydrogen aviation. As you said, um, that's uh, three years ago, no one mentioned hydrogen in aviation. It was like Alex said, I received a lot of messages from my investors and partners. They asked, Alex, what are you doing? So hydrogen aviation is a, it's, it's unbelievable, right? Uh, but in the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, it was a, it's a, a completely different approach. So they have a special council, hydrogen aviation council, de decarbonization of the aviation, and et cetera, et cetera. So that is why you can see that a lot of startups and a lot of companies move to United, United Kingdom to incorporate their company there. And uh, a lot of uh, significant support those companies can receive from UK government. ATI, Aerospace Technology Institute in the United Kingdom, they have several programs to support different aspects of uh, hydrogen aviation development, not only focusing on um, hydrogen fuel cells, but also on, uh, on infrastructure topic, on uh, uh, electric motors, and et cetera, et cetera. So that is why about three years ago, two years ago, I said to everyone, that, hey, hi, uh, UK is the capital of hydrogen aviation. But now what I see, and uh, that's you're absolutely right again, Daniel, that uh, only a few, few presentations did mention hydrogen in their, in their pitches, right, today in this conference. So that is why I see a lot of interest in the United States uh, to hydrogen aviation. And at the same time, we see um, a lot of uh, governmental programs appeared uh, last, uh, last few years to support such activities. So that is why I think that the United States is still a bit behind but uh, the, uh, the situation significantly improved. What, this is what I see in the market right now. Uh, I think there was a, a, a fundamental shift um, in terms of policy with the uh, administration uh, and you know, those, the legislation you were talking about, the, um, the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, or the misnamed uh, legislation, uh, both of those have a, a, a major thrust towards a hydrogen-based economy. And um, I think that the, the approach that's being taken within the uh, uh, administration is to focus on establishing an ecosystem through hydrogen hubs. Um, right now, there's about $8 billion identified for at least four, uh, a DOE is talking about maybe as many as eight that will be geographically distributed around the United States uh, that will be loci of uh, production, distribution, uh, and um, uh, consuming activities. They wanna, they're, they're basically trying to keep a, uh, develop self-sustaining ecosystems. And then they're, one of the key evaluation criteria for candidate proposals in these areas is that they have the opportunity to grow. So they're, in essence, they're laying the seed work for transition of the, the U.S. economy from a fossil fuel-based economy to a hydrogen economy. Um, now, aviation isn't the focus of a lot of that, but aviation can play an important role. Uh, uh, VFS uh, played a, a very important role in organizing um, uh, the H2 Aero uh, white paper. Uh, I really appreciate Mike's leadership and 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 uh, uh, in organizing that group, and they've come out with a white paper that is essentially um, a aggregation of the key uh, elements, a roadmap, if you will, for implementing hydrogen into the aviation uh, uh, ecosystem. And uh, you know, my experience of talking to to the people at DOE headquarters, anyway. Um, 
has been that aviation is sort of seen as, as not, not enough scale to be a primary focus. Um, and they quite rightly look at, uh, yes. you know, like heavy trucks as a primary uh, application for hydrogen, at least, in, you know, initially. And what I'm trying to convince people within the administration is that while aviation may not have the scale of some of those heavy duty applications, it is a lot more, uh, it has a cost structure that's a lot less sensitive to the early stage pricing of, of hydrogen, green hydrogen, which you know is gonna be expensive initially until we can get the economies of scale. And so uh, hopefully we'll be successful in, in gaining support uh, for that, and uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of focus on, uh, in, in when you would look to the FAA uh, on uh, SAF, um, which is great, you know, and that's a very practical way of getting low-hanging fruit uh, uh, in terms of reduce uh, carbon footprint. But ultimately, um, you know, hydrogen ha has has a lot more promise to 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 reduce completely the the, the hydrogen uh, the carbon footprint. So I think we're moving in the right direction legislatively. Yes, Europe had some early uh, early lead, but uh, I think there's there's a, a, at least at, a, at the administration level a, a major shift towards supporting hydrogen. Um, now there's I, I, I'm hoping that that's going to lead to more support in the technology area, in the standards development area, um, uh, and the infrastructure uh, infrastructure planning and support. Elizabeth, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, can you hear me? It's on? Okay, great. Yeah, I, I guess um, from a national lab standpoint, I can't necessarily comment on the policy um, aspect of it, um, but I can echo what you're saying about uh, the heavy duty uh, vehicle um, being, I guess you could call it like a step, a step towards um, aviation. Um, I think the national, lab, the national labs are focusing a lot of their energy and um, funds towards heavy duty vehicle, um, fuel cell vehicle uh, research. Um, and I think that the aviation is the natural next step um, for the National Labs research. And I can say that we have already started beginning doing some research with um, the FAA and other uh, private companies um, to, I guess, start, uh, start the hydrogen aviation sector off a little bit from the National Labs point of view. Um, so, yeah, I can't really comment on the policy, but um, I do think that there's a lot of excitement um, coming from industry and um, the Department of Energy and the uh, aviation space, hydrogen aviation space. Um, yeah, looking forward more to it. And by the way, if you don't mind, I would like to add yes. that in the United Kingdom, uh, they created uh, like an ecosystem for uh, technology development of hydrogen, as I said earlier, but the first commercial adopters actually based in the United States. Uh, Alaska Airlines, United Airlines, so all those companies have uh, agreements with, Air, uh, with uh, Zero Avia, uh, and uh, we have pre-orders from them to replace uh, standard turbines in fixed wing planes to hydrogen version to uh, hydrogen power, power plants. So That's there is a, perhaps it's a different uh, ecosystems, but uh, we can see the first commercial adopters in the United States. Yeah, and we're certainly so much further than we were. Uh, and kind of like you said, John, you know, we, we see an emphasis on hydrogen and hydrogen hubs and aviation, but we haven't seen hydrogen and aviation together yet, but I think we will. And I think the infrastructure is going to be the way to get to that. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. And technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, there's a lot of promise. Um, a lot of the technologies that we're looking at, looking at, in terms of reducing uh, weight and improving energy density and specific power, um, we have a lot of, we have very high, uh, high bars that we're trying to meet and we're graduating it from the lab uh, uh, to, you know, uh, test stands and then you know, we'll be flying uh, a vertical flight aircraft this, this year with a prototype cell. But you know, it's you start a you start a, a long journey with your first step, right? So that's uh, there's a lot of work to do, and I think the government's got uh, an important role to play in, in supporting that that technology maturation. That's great. That that I'm going to skip around a little bit here, but that actually <clears throat> leads into a great question: What role do companies like Piasecki and Zero Zero Avia and others play to get things moving? 
Well, I mean, I think, uh, I think we have the responsibility of proving the efficacy of the technology. And, um, uh, you know, the, it, it, takes, it takes small, innovative, you know, organizations to be able to have the agility to encounter the unexpected. Well, somebody used the term uh, unplanned, unscheduled test events. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and also the cultural willingness to to fail and get back up and 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 reattack the problem. So uh, we're we're very excited about our partnership with uh, Zero Avia. Um, we've we've come a long way, uh, uh, but we've got a much much further to go. Ultimately, um, adoption of the technology is going to be uh, established through practical objective demonstration of capability. And, uh, and we're not gonna do it all at once, it's gonna be stair-stepping. Uh, but uh, listen, everybody's from Missouri until you fly, so. Um. Yep. Yeah, and I just would like to say that not only the Arabian Paiseki, a commercial pro company who is involved in that, in that industry, a lot of companies right now, a lot of the force uh, from different companies uh, to move that and uh, I think that commercial companies like Paiseki, High Point, oh, so sorry, Zeravia. <laughs> <laughs> My previous <laughs> cat. <laughs> yeah, okay, Zeravia. Uh, of course, so we, uh, we, we understand what market wants. So because we speak with, uh, we're speaking with uh, commercial com other commercial companies, airliners, uh, and users of different types of hydrogen technologies. And of course, so we, uh, we can lead the changes of that ecosystem, right? And this is uh, our role. Uh, and of course, so, but this is a industry uh, revolution, I would say. So that is why we have to think about uh, working groups, like in the Vertical Fly Society, we have that, uh, that, but I think we have only one, but we have to create more. So because, uh, and, uh, and uh, to diversify our uh, negotiation and conversation inside, because H2A right now is a, it's a is, every, is about everything, right? But uh, I think the most important thing is that we commercial companies can create like a very, very special working groups for example, about only infrastructure, about, uh, let's say about electric motors, um, propellers, and et cetera, et cetera. So when I think this is the most important thing where again, we can discuss and create ideas and share with, uh, with, uh, with authorities which at the same time they can uh, see that, okay, market is ready to adopt the technology. That's great, they discussed and have a solution. Okay, we're ready to support, simplify rules, simplify policies, and et cetera, et cetera. That I think uh, our roles of commercial companies uh, uh, to, to change that uh, ecosystem. That's great. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that, Elizabeth? Um, well, I think, you know, I agree with what, what you both said. I think it's important as well to, um, emphasize the concerted effort between industry, um, especially in the hydrogen space, um, since there's very little infrastructure already in place um, and st uh, standards and codes. Um, just, yeah, to, to encourage, uh, yeah, concerted effort between industry partners to um, kind of push, push uh, hydrogen aviation forward because um, I think, you know, there's, yeah, a lot of um, need for that to happen. When you look at the, you know, the, the motivating factor for uh, hydrogen, it's, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, reducing carbon footprint. The promise of, at least in the hydrogen fuel cell application, of uh, uh, the pr uh, promise for reduced operating cost is significant. Um, all of the key factors that support uh, that potential benefit need to be validated. And uh, uh, our customers, our launch customers, are not going to make the commitments until they see objective data to support those claims. So, yeah, that's a good point. And you know, it you're exactly right. It is really going to bring down the cost because hydrogen is the most abundant molecule in the universe. But the challenge is it doesn't exist by itself. So you have to get it usually from water. But you can do that with 100% renewable versus, you know, lithium, you have to mine the lithium. It's not exactly a sustainable process, but if we can get to where, you know, we can affordably make hydrogen with renewables, then we can significantly drive down the price. And that brings me to the DOE and the hydrogen shot. And I don't think I have this on there, but I just thought of it. I was wondering, can you comment on what the hydrogen shot is and um, how that might 
I don't know, play out for aviation? Sure. Um, so I, I'm assuming it's, it's targeted towards me. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> I was looking at you. <laughs> um, so the hydrogen shot, I think it's something like one, 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 and they're hoping to get the hydrogen production cost to $1 per kilogram in the next 10 years. Um, so I think by 2030 at this point. Um, and so that's a goal that, that the Department of Energy has released um, and through funding, through these, um, these hydrogen hubs and the other initiatives that uh, the Department of Energy has put through, we're hoping to, uh, or I shouldn't say we, I'm, I'm not the Department of Energy, but the Department of Energy is hoping to um, decrease the cost. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of hope um, that we'll reach that point, and um, I see a lot of promise towards um, getting getting towards there. Um, and the research that we're doing at the labs are, are helping get to that point, and industry as well. And I think I think scaling up hydrogen in the next couple of years will be really important towards um, lowering that cost uh, of hydrogen. Um, and yeah, I think as far as aviation, I think you know having. Um, other industries such as heavy duty vehicles and light duty vehicles expand will only help um, the cost of hydrogen decrease for aviation and, and essentially lower the cost in, gen in, in total for the aviation industry. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so in, in, hydrogen is a widely used industrial gas and it's the vast majority of it is produced through meth uh, methane uh, gas reformation and it's pretty, it's pretty affordable actually. Uh, the problem with that process is it has a huge carbon footprint. Um, there's a whole bunch of technologies being developed for carbon capture during that process. Uh, you know, the industry sort of adopted a color-coded approach. I think they're moving away from that. And in the legislation, I think there are actually standards promulgated that, that define quote unquote clean hydrogen uh, that permit the use of uh, uh, some of these heavier carbon uh, footprint processes provided that they have uh, carbon capture. So I don't, uh, you know, the electrolysis is one area certainly that uh, 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 needs to be looked at and they've got uh, incentives to do that, but, but we need to be looking across the board and, and there's such an industrial infrastructure there right now producing hydrogen. If we can reduce that carbon footprint, I think we've got a, a multiple pass to a, the 111 uh, objectives that DOE has established. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the color system because that, I'm kind of curious in the audience, do you all, you all know about like green, gray, blue hydrogen? I'm seeing a lot of heads nod. Um, and I think there's like turquoise now and there's even brown, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right, John. We do need to be looking at all of those different ways. Of course, I'm a fan of green hydrogen. So I kind of made that obvious when I was talking about electrolysis, but there are other ways to make hydrogen that it's still better than you know the traditional way that we make it, which does have a heavy carbon footprint. Um, Alex, what are your thoughts on that? So um, uh, definitely uh, in the infrastructure, I mean, in generation hydrogen, uh, producing hydrogen is the most important thing if we're talking about adoption of hydrogen technologies in uh, aviation and in zero area. Uh, we have like a team who developed right now, uh, who are developing uh, the the hydrogen generation technologies. And by the way, uh, in our facility in Campbell in the United Kingdom, so we not purchase the hydrogen at all, we generate it. So in our concept in Zerevi, that we uh, will produce hydrogen on site during uh, like a, a standard electricity, uh, electricity uh, process using green energy, right? So, uh, and of course, so the AM1111, I think is achievable. Uh, especially if we will integrate in that, uh, like in, in, in that calculation, uh, carbon credits, which we can, um, um, how to say, carbon certificates, right? So, and that's uh, I think may may support uh, one dollar per, per 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 kilogram. But again, it depends on uh, where is the location of the airport, because as as I said in our team, uh, right now we're investigating different use cases uh, and commercial cases because. Uh, Zero Area wants to uh, um, uh, provide a solution for our customers as a, like an all included. So you just need to pay, you don't need to care about how to obtain hydrogen. 
So you just need to pay to for hourly rate to use our hydrogen uh, power plant. That's it. So this is a uh, belongs. This headache belongs to us. We will provide you everything you want, uh, and uh, and like in the least scheme, scheme as, as usual. So this is uh, uh, what we do in uh, Zeravia, and uh, just kind of reminded one of the investor in Zeravia, and we know a lot about infrastructure is Shell, who is a manufacturer of hydrogen, actually, is number one in, in, in the world. As uh, John mentioned, that is a very, very convenient gas. You can buy it everywhere. It looks like, oh, hydrogen is something I, I can meet. It, it, actually, not. So it's produced only in the United States. It produced about 100 uh, million tons a day, if I remember. A day or a, I, I forgot. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge amount of uh, hydrogen produces every day. That's really cool. I, I wonder is, you know, can we learn from automotive and, you know, seeing like what happened with the refueling stations in California where I think if I remember you have a Toyota yeah. Mirai um, you, and you can't really drive outside of California. Um, right that's now. true. Mm -hmm. So that's true. This is one of the uh, limitation to penetrate that technology. And, and again, infrastructure is, is a problem, right? So, uh, but uh, the, uh, you, you can travel outside of California, that, that's absolutely true, but we can uh, see that uh, program again is an uh, infrastructure act, right? So in the United States, they also cover some uh, that, that aspects of so building pipelines, hydrogen hubs, and uh, uh, expand uh, hydrogen refueling station network across the United States. So that is what uh, will happen. But, well, but, but there's a different question about uh, the Toyota Mirai, it's if it survive or not. But for aviation, so of course, it's very, very adaptable technology for uh, airport, airports, because actually airports has a lot of approvals to use different uh, dangerous materials, gases in their, in their area. So that is why we don't see that it should be a big issue to install additional tanks or uh, hydrogen uh, ele uh, electrolyzers in uh, uh, in airports on site. Yeah. yeah, and with many airports already use hydrogen in forklifts, so it's not like they don't have the hydrogen, you know, there already. I'm glad that. You and by the way, so, sorry. By the yeah, way, this is a good good comment because uh, forklift uh, is a company who led uh, that uh, technology was plug power, right? So and they right now moving to infrastructure company, right? So the, the, rather than just a fuel cell company. So they are going to build uh, hydrogen hubs uh, um, everywhere. So this is a part. This is a one of their part um, uh, part of their strategy to be in the market and what they are going to do next several years. Yeah, that's exciting. So we're, what I wonder is, are we going to? You know, industry seems to sort of be trending towards SAF, and then at the same time we have you know these hubs being built, which sounds like it's really going to solve the infrastructure at the beginning rather than waiting for the situation like, you know, we've got all the refueling stations in California and people can't leave. We spread these hubs out all over the U.S. We can fly anywhere. But then as we're building out these hubs, we have airports getting ready for SAF. What does that look like? And should we be talking? I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Should the airports and the hubs be talking more? Are they or can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think I think hydrogen plays a role in in. In aviation, I think, and SAF does as well. It's national labs. We're looking at all of the different propulsion types. Um, we're not going to roll out one. Um, and so I think I think what's been seen is that SAF can be implemented now, and, and there are companies like Zero Avia who have shown that um, you know hydrogen hydrogen technology can be used in planes. Um, but SAF SAF can be used now, and that's where a lot of um, airports are looking towards. But I think as the infrastructure um, for hydrogen infrastructure increases at the airports and for um, in these hubs, uh, hydrogen y utilization at airports will increase also. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Can I, do you wanna, thank you. Do you want to come out on that, John? Well, I mean, I mean SAF is a very practical uh, way of getting the carbon footprint for aviation down. I think it needs to be supported. Um, uh, the, the main promise that hydrogen brings to the table in the vertical lift sector is that it's the opportunity to be able to electrify rotorcraft uh, and uh, remove the primary uh, cost of operations in rotorcraft, which is the turbine engine. And you can run a turbine engine on SAF uh, and, uh, and reduce your carbon footprint, but it's not gonna make that 
engine uh, less expensive. You have, to, you, have, you have to get away from the complexity, uh, the maintenance costs, et cetera, of turbine engines. So uh, I think SAF is a great idea. And I think SAF should be used in turbine helicopters uh, as soon as we, you know, we can uh, establish its uh, safety and, and promulgate it. But the promise of electric VTOL is to expand the application of vertical flight across a much broader set of use cases by bringing the cost down. And so the promise of hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells, which have very few moving parts, uh, is is to do that, is, but still provide for competitive performance. And so I know that you know the EV tall you know community you know, that that is focused on batteries has built you know business case around you know urban environments, and that's that's great. But when we look to our customers in the in the helicopter industry, for instance, uh, EMS operators and what have you. Uh, their mission profiles are 200 nautical miles plus reserves, um, and uh, and so batteries just you know they're not going to cut it. So uh, they have improved a lot, but when you look at the uh, potential, uh, you know a lot of those those improvements are going to be flattening out. Now new chemistries might come along, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, th and that's that's great. But from from the work that we've done. Uh, Hydrogen offers the best opportunity for those longer range missions that existing paying operators, you know, need to be able to. Yeah, that's good. And I'll just add to that. Um, you know, if you think about, let's say you want to build, you know, a home that's 100% renewable, you're not going to sit there and say, should I use solar panels or wind turbines? You're going to use, you know, your geothermal, your wind, your solar, you're going to use all of it. And that's what I like to think about when I think about eVTOL, especially with hydrogen, the batteries do play a role. So I, I don't really like to think about it, and I don't think you were saying this, I'm just adding this in, but you know, instead of it, it's not batteries versus hydrogen fuel cells, it's batteries and hydrogen fuel cells, although Alex might disagree with me, um, but I'm curious what, uh, what your thoughts are on that. But I think you know, the ideal performance is you, know, you have your battery for lift, then you have you know, hydrogen for cruise, and then battery for landing. No, no, it depends on uh, today lunch we have uh, interesting conversation and I don't want to say that lithium batteries is, uh, should be, not, not, shouldn't be integrated. Yeah, of course, yes, because it depends on the mission you have, right? So if you have only just a few flights a day, uh, so like a long time, short term, uh, five minutes, lithium batteries will be more than enough. But if you are talking about some flights about whether you need to fly 100, 100 nautical miles, right? So, and et cetera. So, you must uh, use another power source. So, I, I think that both uh, uh, several uh, power, power sources we have on the market uh, have their own uh, niche on, on that market. So, specifically, again, based on uh, specific um, specific missions you would like to execute with this, if it all or um, any, any aircraft. Cool. And John, I just would like to say, if you, you said that if you, sell, you have only a few moving parts, uh, if you see that, it seems that something unscrewed and you have to fix that as soon as possible. <laughs> because there is no moving parts in fuel cell at all. <laughs> so. They have a few fans, but I get your point. Um, economics, sustainable economics is, is what's going to uh, make EV toll and hydrogen EV toll uh, penetrate the market. And, uh, and so, Carbon footprint is important, but if you don't have the economics, it's not going to be adopted. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Can you talk about, Elizabeth, can you talk about what projects um, or experiments that NREL is working on? I think we had talked about a facility you all were building, and what's the status? Do you know which one I'm talking about? No, I, I don't know which one you're talking about. When I saw it, it was a 3D render, so I don't know if it, it maybe it hasn't done anything Is yet. this a, a heavy duty? Is this aviation? Yeah. Oh, heavy duty. Heavy duty. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, we have several projects, I guess, somewhat related to aviation and, and some related to avi aviation specifically. Um, I can't go into too much detail about them. Um, I think the one that you're referring to is the um, heavy duty vehicle simulator that we have um, at our lab uh, that's fully built. We've been testing it. Um, I think most recently we tested, uh, I think it was 80 kilogram fueling um, of hydrogen into our heavy duty vehicle simulator, which um, some could say is 
could be used in a light, uh, uh, a small air, aircraft, small airplanes um, could be transferred into that uh, space. Um, so at NREL, we are working heavily in the heavy duty um, vehicle space and uh, have the capabilities to do that sort of testing. Um, we are looking into doing liquid fueling testing. Um, we don't have that capability yet, but there's been a lot of interest from industry uh, to start looking into that space. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the heavy duty vehicle space, uh, hydrogen heavy duty vehicle space, um, I'm more than, happy, more than happy to talk about it more. Um, but that's one area we're looking in. And as I mentioned before, we're also working with the FAA uh, to do a, um, a technical, I guess a technical infrastructure report analysis for them, looking at uh, airports and fueling demand for, um, for aviation um, and uh, working with industry partners to collect data uh, to um, kind of see what the expected fuel demand is uh, for that. So we can start designing airports um, and get some of these codes and standards as well uh, moving along um, and just have a roadmap, I guess, for a lot of the airports that want to transition to uh, hydrogen aviation. That's exciting. When is that supposed to be? Is that already in work? And when is that expected to be published? So there's, I guess there's two parts to that study. We have um, an electric or battery uh, VTOL part of that study. Um, and the, the uh, publication for that will be released this summer. Uh, the hydrogen portion of that uh, we're still working on. And um, the, the paper will probably be released at the end of this year, um, maybe next year. We're working on that right now. So if you're an industry partner who uh, works in hydrogen um, aviation and you want to uh, give us your data, come speak to me. Um, we're looking to collect data uh, for that project. That, that leads to my next question. Well, I was going to say, what do you <laughs> need from industry? Um, that's definitely something that we would like to help with um, and support as much as we can. Sure. Um, so yeah, data collection is one, one part that we're really looking to help with. Um, specifically flight data and uh, hydrogen demand, energy demand uh, for the airplanes or aircraft themselves. Um, we're looking to be a good data repository um, so that uh, we can kind of generate models uh, for aviation, uh, unexpected fuel demand and infrastructure uh, at airports. Uh, we already have a lot of uh, heavy duty vehicle, light duty vehicle um, infrastructure models and we're hoping to build out that capability as well. Awesome. Well, I'll be looking for that this summer and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. If there was one thing, John, I'll ask you first. If there's one thing that government d does to help hydrogen aviation in the U.S., what would it be if you had to pick one thing? One thing. Well, the most important thing for us and our community is to, to understand uh, uh, what the rules are, the road, or, are for the road to, towards certification. And, um, and there's a whole learning process that's got to happen with hydrogen. Um, and we're looking forward to working with the FAA. We are working with the FAA. They're, um, frankly, leaning forward uh, in that process. And so over the next uh, three years or so, we'll be doing development work uh, that will inform those, th those certification criteria um, and uh, the community, I mean, I'm talking about the SAEs and uh, the standard societies, um, have a lot of work to do in order to establish consensus-based standards that we can refer to as an industry to, to get the technology safely developed and fielded. And so the government's got the ultimate responsibility uh, for doing that. So that's the number one thing. That, that's great. And, and speaking of SAE, um, they're here and they have three working groups um, specifically on hydrogen aviation already. So um, those things are being worked on. I just wanted to give a little shout out to SAE because um, we've, they've done a lot of really cool work and they've presented at our group a couple of times. Uh, Alex, one thing, what would it be? My personal experience, right? So, I mean, uh, when we incorporated High Point uh, three years ago, uh, we received a lot of data because it's an innovative hydrogen fuel cell based on high temperature membrane, new system architecture. So we did a lot of uh, our internal tests in the lab. So and when we presented our customers, they say, oh, Rale, so you know, this is, a, this is your internal lab test, and et cetera, we would like to get more uh, validation. 
So what we did, we, we went to Envel, by the way, and they did for us specific special program. So where we are tested our, our approaches and ideas and uh, we, what we receive in Envel in our lab measured out. But everything is good. So it's a, provide a lot of credibility to our company and we all report our report. It's the same, see? But uh, we were startup, and uh, when we, uh, we signed agreement with Andrel, it, it was significant money we spent on that. And uh, for startup, you know, it's each dollar, I say, especially <laughs> in the beginning, is very, very important. <laughs> so perhaps I think for uh, hydrogen innovation startup companies, startups, and community is, uh, ecosystem, I would say, if government can create some like a tax return program or something R and D supported or something like that, that will be really valuable especially for innovations uh, in hydrogen innovation. So because I see a lot of companies in Silicon Valley who are trying to do something in electric motor, uh, in the hydrogen fuel cell, in hydrogen storage, and et cetera, et cetera. But we need really support from, uh, from government to get easier, the access to, to that funds should be easier or tax return, something like that. That will be helpful up to my mind. I, I, and I, agree I, more I, I do have to give a shout out to AFWorks. Um, they have uh, been huge, huge help in our development efforts, and uh, and I expect that role to play uh, to be expanding. Um, uh, the, the Department of Defense does have a mandate to look for ways of reducing its carbon footprint. The challenge is as as good as hydrogen has the potential to be um, in energy density. You know, some of the missions that are required for the Department of Defense are are so energy intense that uh, it's, it's not gonna be addressed with anything but a you know, turbine or, or jet capability. Mm -hmm. But there are a large and I think significant uh, uh, group of missions that could be. And so it uh, could be addressed by uh, electric propulsion, hydrogen electric propulsion. So um, AFWorks has, uh, and, and also AFWorks has this mission of also looking at how can they how can they support the uh, commercial development of technologies in the aerospace sector? And, um, and so I think hydrogen is gonna be an important example of what, what that, uh, that potential is. And I think Agility Prime is gonna be speaking tomorrow or what have you. And, and uh, I just wanna uh, express our appreciation to them. Um, uh, the work that they've done is also an opportunity for creating a locus uh, across the departments, uh, I'm thinking a working group for the U.S. government that provides for interagency dialogue, education, awareness. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, uh, in this case, uh, uh, certainly NREL uh, and DOE um, and the FAA, and uh, and I think NASA has a role to play as well. Uh, Probably big, uh, along with DOD. Excuse this uh, real novice question, but new to hydrogen and aviation. Um, what's the compelling uh, use case for hydrogen versus batteries? Um, I know you mentioned range as one, but when we consider like energy density and storage space in an end-to-end -end electrical power system, what are some of the trade-offs between batteries versus a hydrogen-based electrical system? Take that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, it, once again, I, as I said earlier, it depends on the mission, right? So, uh, uh, for instance, at Zero Avia, we have started. We initially we started focus on retrofit uh, aircrafts, uh, standard fixed wing aircrafts and airlines uh, like a um, two A, two two A, which was uh, uh, last week we did the first flight. And uh, retrofit business model actually you just replace existing, uh, uh, replace existing. Uh, uh, aircrafts with hydrogen version. So it means that market already exists. Exist. The same stuff right now we're doing with John uh, when we design a helicopter. Uh, he designed a helicopter and we provide uh, our powertrain to that, uh, not powertrain, just a fuel cell uh, for that helicopters. And again, John is addressing to existing market segments. So, and where we understand that you have to fly longer and et cetera, et cetera. And when you, uh, See, uh, consider existing missions, so you will understand that lithium batteries, it will be complicated to find a solution with, uh, with lithium batteries to, uh, to replace existing, uh, existing aircrafts. But for new market segments like air taxes and et cetera, so of course you, you have a lot of um, 
uh, place and rooms to use lithium batteries and that and such aircraft like EVTOLs in air taxis, business models and etc. John, would you like to add something? Well, I can tell you what uh, Alex said to me when he sold me on the idea of hydrogen fuel cells. And no, it's what was me. It's, it was Luigi. <laughs> okay, so the the metrics that yeah. that caught our attention is the uh, potential for uh, five five times the uh, uh, energy density of lithium ion batteries, uh, threefold increase in specific power, um, uh, reduction in operating costs relative to the turbine engine by as much as 50%, yeah. uh, um, and uh, zero carbon footprint. I think there's all other other benefits too, uh, there's, uh, including the uh, reduction in acoustic signature. Um, and uh, those, those attributes are pretty compelling. Uh, uh, you do mention some, some important challenges. Volumetric density is a big issue for, for hydrogen. Um, fuel cells, you know, the, they generate power based on their surface area, so they take up space. So when you, you design a vehicle, uh, uh, or when you apply hydrogen fuel cells, you almost have to design the aircraft around it. Um, and uh, that's a big air, air vehicle integration uh, uh, challenge. Um, uh, we're pretty excited about it because we've- but, but it's not fundamental limitation, right, John? So it's just a question- No, it's just, it's, it's, a question, it's a question of design challenge. Yeah. Challenge, and, challenges are opportunities. And when John says five times energy density, he means specific energy. Um, the volumetric energy, as he mentioned, is is still low, um, but we're working on that. But it does have five times specific. So if you, for those of us that have taken Dr. Wong's class, you know, hydrogen's right now about here, and we want it to be up here, if you know what chart I'm talking about. I know you all do, because we use it all the time. But um, so it does still have, you know, uh, it takes up a lot of space. And, and that's the big drawback. But there are things that we can do about that. But it does carry much more energy, five times more energy per kilogram than fossil fuels. So. One, of the, one of the biggest questions that we have to address uh, in this H2 era uh, uh, white paper that the VFS um, sponsored um, you know, addresses a lot of the practical infrastructure issues with hydrogen, but in terms of vehicle integration, uh, the decision to go gaseous versus liquid hydrogen is, is a big choice. For the larger vehicles, I think, you know, particularly in the fixed wing area, um, liquid hydrogen is going to be pretty important. There is a, there is a dividing line where gaseous uh, becomes um, uh, an option. Uh, it's in the, you know, the smaller gross weights. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the challenge for us is our primary application is right on the dividing line. So we're going to have to make a, a decision. But, um, that's going to be not just a technical decision, that's going to be economic decision based on required infrastructure, et cetera. That makes sense. Uh, I think we had one over here. Uh, Compared with the fuel system, yeah? in the fuel tank, we have a regulation 25.981.8.3, which is uh, Ignition prevention, this is nightmare. It's very, very difficult to, to accomplish because there is a requirement for validation and also for verification, a test and test. The question I have now for <clears throat> hydrogen, do you think the requirement for design and installation will be uh, as rigid as also as stringent as uh, for the fuel tank for comparison? That's all, my question. If I have to compare, I have designing fuel system for the engine, right? We have a fuel system because it's not only tank. Yeah, associated with tank, with plumbing, with the motor, with the coupling devices, right? With the valve, so many, many things we have to concern to be safe, to swing safe. But now with the hydrogen, I want to compare it just to think that will it be very complex. <laughs> complex. Something that I want to avoid. Very, very complex. Is That's it, all I it, want to know. 
Sorry, I, you know, I haven't grown up in aviation. My hearing's been severely uh, damaged, so I didn't get everything you asked. But uh, I think the general question was the complexity of, the, of not just the fuel cell, but the overall balance of the plant uh, and its integration with the aircraft. Was that, is that? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so in, 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 in the helicopter world, we have part 27, part 29. Um, uh, we're going to have to develop standards for implementation of the hydrogen fuel cell uh, in th that'll be applicable to both those. Uh, but a, you know, a lot of the challenge in the design is, is not just volumetric, it's thermal management. Um, actually, yes. What's that? that? Actually, yes, I think that's uh, one of the most important questions. Yeah. Uh, it's it, because the well, particularly the technology that we're working with Zero Avia on is uh, Zero Avia on is a high temperature PEM fuel cell which um, is air cooled or it, well, it's not I wouldn't say cooled it's air managed uh, mm -hmm. and so that's a high throughput of a lot of volume of air going through the aircraft to manage the temperature of the reaction cycle in this fuel cell so uh, there's a lot of integration. Uh, uh, challenges or opportunities, and there's also synergies uh, between the air vehicle design and the implementation of the of the fuel cell that can improve weight and can improve performance. And one of the benefits for fuel cell specifically, right? So you can do that. Uh, the system usually uh, modular, so you can distribute. You can create a special package and distribute components of the system in the aircraft. When you design the aircraft like a uh, the classic gas turbine, uh, gas turbine, you have to like package very, very complex in one place. In uh, comparison with fuel cell, as I said earlier, you can distribute it in the in the aircraft. Yeah, but the main the, the main challenge is uh, actually is uh, uh, heat distribution and, and this stuff. Yeah, correct. Um, another big benefit of the fuel cell that w that we see is uh, redundancy. Um, and graceful degradation. Um, if anybody's been in an airplane when the engine shuts off, it gets very quiet. Uh, very, uh, and and uh, in the fuel cell, um, you can lose a portion of the system and the balance of the system will continue to operate. So it's, it has a graceful degradation. Okay. I think that is our time. So thank you, Alex, John, and Elizabeth. Yeah. Make sure and join us in June. <laughs>